I'm Onyi Sunday. Thanks for joining us. The annual Nigeria Oil and Gas Conference is organized by Nigeria's Ministry of Petroleum Resources and Nigeria's National Petroleum Corporation. It provides a platform for players in Nigeria's oil and gas industry to discuss and debate the most pressing issues facing the sector. Now let's take a look at some of the highlights that marked the 2015 edition which took place in the nation's capital, Abuja. This year had senior representatives from government in attendance, new and existing managing directors of international and independent oil companies, as well as other players in the industry voicing different perspectives. Top on the agenda is the dip in oil prices. Oil prices may limit industry scope to maneuver in growing long-term production and reaching the target of 4.0 million barrels of oil per day. Under a sustained low oil price, industry must challenge itself to raise funding for projects in order to meet these targets. This will call for radical changes in the cost environment, improved contracts to project management, and innovative financing mechanisms. However, in the event of moderate oil price recovery, we would still require innovative funding and greater private sector involvement across the hydrocarbon value chain. It's a difficult time that we face together. Uh, there is fear. There is fear in our staff, in all the companies. There is fear in the staff of the service, contractors, communities. Um, I think we need to be optimistic. Uh, we represent an industry uh, which can adapt and uh, adapt uh, very quickly. Uh, we need to pre be prepared to face uh, maybe a long period with this level of price. So it's not, it's not a short-term impact. This is a long-term impact that we need to be prepared. While the current situation might look challenging, the lower oil price is believed to be an advantage for other sectors of Nigeria's economy. Two broad advantages in the lower oil price. One is, uh, is that uh, we expect productivity gains in certain sectors of the economy. In other words, transportation, take aviation for example, the cost of the price of a ticket should, uh, uh, should go down as a result of uh, lower uh, prices for, for jet care, etc. So there are benefits to the economy in, uh, in uh, uh, lower energy prices and productivity, etc. We all need to make sure that whenever the oil price picks up again, we're there to capitalize on that. Uh, so we need to make sure that we survive in the meantime, whatever long it will take. And a number of measures are already taken, uh, mainly cost reduction measures. I think we should also look at uh, efficiency improvement measures together with NMPC and NAPIMS. Um, but we have to make sure that we don't overdo it and don't panic. Because um, already the industry is lacking capacity and capability, particularly in the area of human resources. This further highlights the need to build capacity in Nigeria's oil and gas sector, especially after divestments in the sector and the growth of indigenous oil companies. Uh, we have whole uh, large programs on education, uh, especially, I would say, starting from primary school, secondary, tertiary, helping the universities and so on. And it, it's even more important to continue now with these programs. And um, I've always thought that Nigeria should, be, should have the top universities in the world. And uh, most of our seniors in the room have been graduated from a Nigerian university, and now they are at top management positions. So there is nothing wrong to study in Nigeria, but we need to assist. The reality is this, is that there is a disconnect between funding universities and meeting the demands of uh, people, uh, demands of the industry, speaking from the perspective of the oil and gas industry, and that disconnect uh, is because the educational system was designed to be a kind of trickle down from government, you know, trickle down from government. 
And we have to create uh, what I call a joint industry project, uh, GIPs, in terms of a joint industry curriculum, where you have three components to it, private sector, service industry, uh, uh, quasi-private sector, oil, oil, oil companies, uh, then you have the university community. In this three-way cycle to say, listen, I can invest in R&D in this university in exchange for having students uh, that can meet my own needs. With divestments in the sector, Nigeria's oil and gas space has witnessed an increase in indigenous oil and gas firms. The conference was also an opportunity for the new players to share their experiences and expectations from the sector. One critical thing which I like discussing is we do not have convergence of policies. We have the Nigerian content law wanting to create jobs and of course we have the Minister of Finance wanting to re increase revenues from taxes and all. So an indigenous vessel is actually by law to pay 10% duty and of course a foreign vessel is to do temporary import permit of $5 million. Put in perspective, a vessel costing $100 million will have to pay $10 million and if you rent the same asset you pay $5 million. It is ridiculous and of course it discourages investments. But not being deterred, we believe some of us will have to be the lamb, will have to carry the cross, and of course we have to do the needful. And that's what we've done to show and to have empirical evidence so that on the day we'll be able to show the legislators that really and truly it is not just making business sense to do what we've been doing. In a room filled with oil magnates, issues pertaining to the environment are sure to arise. A lot of you operate to very high international standards. How did it occur in the first place? If you operate in Nigeria the same way that you operate anywhere else, how did it get to the point where we have the conditions that are described in the UNEP report? With the recent um, interest that the petroleum minister essentially has shown in this, we have broad-based community groups that are involved in this work now that this can be dealt with. I'm pretty confident it can be done. My biggest concern remains that the tap is still open. So as we speak, large-scale bunkering and crude theft is still happening. Most of, unfortunately, most of our uh, uh, unfortunate theft incidents still happen in that axis. So we have to work collaboratively. We have to first make sure that we deal with the issue of theft. Until we're able to do it, we will commit a billion, we will commit two billion. The reality is that it will just keep reoccurring. Vandalism of oil pipelines has been a major issue in Nigeria's oil and gas space. It's been blamed for the slow growth of the sector and oil spills. In 2013, Nigeria was reported to have lost about 150,000 barrels of crude oil per day. Each time the pipelines connecting the country's oil export terminals were shut down as a result of vandalism. Gas utilization is a primary goal of Nigeria's petroleum and energy policies. With a proven reserve of 260 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, Nigeria's gas reserve is triple the nation's crude oil resources. Described as an emerging sector owing to its underutilization in the past, gas is gradually taking a top position in Nigeria's oil and gas space, especially its power sector. Every power plant in this country is connected to a permanent gas supply source, uh, a situation we didn't have before. So we, I believe that not only are we increasing this capacity, but we are enhancing the flexibility of supply to the power plants. And the idea is to make sure that there is no demand center that is accessing gas from just one route, so that there is redundancy in the supply uh, to those uh, places. It means that really, as we speak today, we are supplying or have the capacity to supply enough gas to overcome the complete usage of petrol, diesel, and kerosene generation in Nigeria. That is a level of progress that we have made. And if all our efforts were actually translated into power delivery uh, without the disruptions we're facing in pipeline, Nigerians would have been able to see that benefit. These achievements, however, are yet to impact on the everyday lives of Nigerians. The four challenges we are facing, and which make it difficult for you to see the benefits of the work we have done, 
The first one is pipeline vandalism. Between January and today, uh, like Professor Neber told you, we have had close to seven attacks on our gas pipelines. That excludes attacks on the crude oil pipelines. And every time there's an attack on a crude oil pipeline, it also affects gas production because we use the same pipeline to evacuate condensate. Between June last year and today, we have had a cumulative of 56 to 60 attacks on the crude oil and the gas pipelines in this country. The implication of this is that there has never been a time in the last six months that our entire network is working. If we have the West fixed, the East is blown. If the East is blown, not blown, then the West is blown. And so we keep running and chasing our tail. This development has also affected Nigeria's ability to meet its domestic and export demands outside Nigeria. Part of the problem is that for most of our infrastructure, we, we create little or no flexibilities or redundancies. So they break one line and the whole section of the country is down. If there were multiple pipelines, then you create the flexibility. You create loops so that if there's a destruction on one, you, re, you redirect. So we, we've, got to, we've got to improve the flexibility of these pipelines. We've got to adopt technologies that would, be, that would make us recognize an attempt more proactively. So it's not until the damage is done, it's until we must know as the attempt, and we must also have creative ways of managing it after the attempt. Despite the downtimes recorded, the gas sector has gained some environmental credits. Nigeria is reputed to be the largest gas flaring country in the world. Today, the country has reduced its gas flare from 2.5 billion cubic feet per day recorded in 2010 to 1.5 billion cubic feet per day. The conference also afforded foreign and indigenous oil and gas firms the opportunity to showcase their products and engineering expertise employed during operations. The PSO facility on the site, marine and fabrication on the site. To round up the event, a gala night was held to recognize industry experts. Companies in the sector that did well over time were also honored, and Owando PLC won the 2015 Excellence Award. And that's it on this special featuring highlights from the 2015 edition of the Nigeria Oil and Gas Conference, which took place in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. I'm Onyi Sunday. Thanks for watching.